Good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you very much for joining our session this afternoon, which is part of National Conveyancing Week. Um, I am Frances McDonald. I'm a director in the residential research team um, at Savills. Hopefully all of you will be aware of Savills in terms of um, their offerings as a um, residential sales and lettings business. Um, but I thought I'd just give a brief um, introduction into what we do in the residential research team. So we cover all aspects of the residential housing markets from um, affordable housing all the way up to kind of super prime um, new build and secondhand homes um, within London. Um, we cover the UK markets as a whole across all price points um, and we do a lot of work with um, developers and house builders um, both on the consultancy side um, and also more um, on kind of public facing work so lots of um, presentations such as this one um, but also um, publications um, and work for um, the national press. So commentating a lot on um, what's happening across the housing market um, and I'm going to take some of that insight um, and give you all an update um, today on what uh, we're experiencing across the residential um, housing markets more generally. So firstly I think important to think about what's happening with the economy um, and what we've seen so far in terms of market activity in the first few months of 2024. So I think firstly the narrative has kind of changed to when the bank base rate is likely to be cut. Um, so I think up until kind of the end of last year, it was very much, will we see another rise? Will we um, see rates remain at this level for a period? Whereas now it's very much more focused on when that cut is likely to come. Um, I'd say at the beginning of the year, people were expecting it to perhaps be slightly earlier, um, maybe in e even in the March um, or indeed the May um, uh, MPC meetings. It's looking like that's uh, maybe pushed out slightly, maybe later in the year, um, but I'll touch on that in a bit more detail um, as we move forward. Reasons for that being slightly pushed um, pushed out is we're still seeing relatively high levels of inflation, so still running at 4% in January of this year. Um, so whilst that's down quite significantly from the peaks of um, well over 10% that we saw in 2023, still double what the Bank of England are hoping for. So their target obviously at 2% and we're still running at that 4%. And at the same time, we've got relatively strong levels of wage growth. So that's kind of also giving some more narrative as to why the Bank of England haven't cut um, haven't cut that base rate just yet, where people's wages um, are still increasing. At the same time, we saw in the final three months of last year um, that GDP growth fell into negative territory. So we went into a technical um, recession, although you can see there only by 0.3 percent. So actually relatively marginal um, in terms of what we um, in terms of the kind of level of recession that we saw. Um, and I think also important to note that the latest GDP figures for January, which came in after I put these slides together. Um, so for the first month of this year, we saw positive levels of GDP growth. So I think around 0.4%. So that's kind of putting um, putting things into context and showing that, um, you know, that there's perhaps some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, some of the commentary we're hearing from economic forecasters is that um, that momentum is likely to continue, particularly as we're now seeing um, lower levels of inflation than we were um, throughout 2023. Then moving on to um, the hexagons I've got in the yellow, and um, you can see there that RICS, so new buyer inquiries, um, we use that as a sort of forward looking indicator for what's likely to happen um, to prices across the UK housing market. So it monitors the net balance of opinion on um, supply and demand across the housing market. We saw that new buyer inquiries tipped into positive territory for the first time since early 2022. So that was in January. And we've just had, um, again, hot off the press, um, we've just had the February data come out um, last night as well. And that's also remained in positive territory. So we're beginning to see the early signs of much more demand coming back um, to the residential sales markets. And that's already fed into um, improved levels of activity. So you can see there net agreed sales. So using 20 CI data, which collates um, 
information from all of the property portals, they're actually 9% above where they were before the pandemic throughout January and February. Um, and they're up considerably across the UK, so by around 30% when you compare um, to the first two months of 2023. So really strong signs that we're beginning to see that demand return. And then finally, um, thinking about what's happened to prices. So the nationwide index shows that we've seen modest monthly price growth um, in the past five, uh, in, in five out of the past six months. So again, showing signs that um, the market is beginning to pick up, although there does remain some kind of tentativity um, across buyers. At the same time, though, we're still seeing that price adjustments remain very high. So whilst those agreed sales, as I touched on, are up 9% compared to before the pandemic, price adjustments, which we generally see as being price falls um, or, or price reductions on a property that's being marketed, they're up 54% compared to that same benchmark. So whilst those agreed sales are taking place, vendors are having to be much more realistic on what they're likely to achieve. They're having to bring those prices down before those agreed sales um, are taking place. So still some realignment taking place between what buyers are able to afford um, and what sellers are um, willing to accept in terms of a price. And then finally there, mortgage approvals. So we're still seeing that they're down by around 14% compared to before the pandemic. Um, so that kind of contradicts that agreed sales number in a way. And that's because we're still seeing much more cash buyers in the market. So before the pandemic, we saw that between 30 and 33% of the whole UK market was um, bought by um, cash buyers. Uh, during last year, we saw that increase to around 42%. So that shows you how those that were able to um, took advantage of there being less competition um, from those with a mortgage as interest rates have been higher. Um, and that's led to the market being more dominated by those cash um, and equity rich buyers. So just touching more on those activity levels that I talked about, you can see here, this is a month by month run through um, of where net agreed sales are compared to before the pandemic. So you can see that pretty consistently throughout 2023, we saw activity levels um, far below where they were before the pandemic. You can see there in some months, we saw them down by more than 20%. Whereas throughout January and February, we've seen that pick up to um, an average of 9%, as I've touched on already. I think really interesting to also look just at London. So when we look at London, when you're compared to last year, January and February um, was up 38% in terms of net agreed sales. So stronger than we've seen um, across the UK market as a whole. And similarly, for that pre-pandemic comparison, we saw um, that those net agreed sales were up 19%. So really strong pickup in London. I think partly because... Um, we're seeing a bit more demand return to kind of city markets um, as that kind of return to the office continues. People are perhaps back um, working from home a bit less than they were expecting. Um, and that's just driving some more demand into those city markets and particularly um, into London. And so what does that mean in terms of what we're seeing for the cost of mortgage debt? So I touched on how we've seen um, rates come down. Um, this chart is basically just looking at one example of a high street lender. So nationwide, um, a 75 percent loan to value, uh, different products that they offer. We, we monitor this on quite a regular basis. So this at the moment is up to the end of February. You can see there um, in the different coloured lines, um, the different products that they're offering. So the two year tracker in the red, two year fix in the light blue and then the five year fix in the dark blue. You can see the initial peak that we saw um, after the mini budget in September of 2022. You can see there um, that two year fix peaking at almost 6%. Um, and then actually we saw a second peak um, throughout the summer of last year. And that was down to inflation remaining much higher um, than many people were expecting. And so lenders became much more cautious, put their rates up again. Um, and you can see there that particularly that two year fix um, went up more than it had done originally um, after the mini budget. So up well above 6% there. Um, that's partly because the um, 
if the short term nature of the two year fixes um, means that when people are when the lenders are uncertain about the market in the short term, um, they'll price those two and five year fixes slightly differently. But then you can see we've had a steady downward trajectory um, of those rates um, since the summer of last year, right up until um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, but actually, in the last few weeks, we have seen them begin to creep up again ever so slightly. So again, that's just down to that inflation data that came out for January. I think some lenders got a bit ahead of themselves, perhaps at the beginning of the year, um, kind of priced in a bank base rate cut sooner than has happened um, and then that, that latest inflation data came in and they had to increase um, their rates once again just to ensure that their margins were still um, making sense so you can see there at the moment we've got two-year fix at about 4.7 percent and that five-year fix at 4.35 percent so actually back to where we were roughly at the beginning of the year although much lower than we saw um, during that peak of the summer in 2023. And final point on this slide I would make is just around um, the bubble that I've got there on the far left hand side. And that's just what this, these products currently revert to. And I think just really important to point out because when people are going to get these mortgages, this is what they'll be tested against. Um, so it currently reverts to just under 8%. And so whilst the rates have come down quite significantly, if they're still being tested um, at that level, then that just kind of highlights how people's affordability is still um, appearing to be relatively stretched when they're coming to take out a mortgage. And then just thinking about what we're expecting to happen throughout kind of the rest of 2024 and what's what's on the way. So the obvious one um, for the housing markets is the general election. Um, and we use for this, we, we actually just keep an eye on odds checker, which um, just basically gives you an idea of what the general public are thinking is likely to happen, um, both in terms of when the general election is likely to take place, um, but also the outcome of that general election. So this again was last done at the end um, of February. And you can see here that at the moment, um, the most likely outcome as per odds checker um, is that the date of the general election will be um, in the final quarter of the year. Um, and that the outcome will be a Labour majority. Obviously, we don't know if this is definitely correct, but it does just give us a good idea um, of what people are thinking and how they're um, kind of behaving in terms of the general election. So obviously, some political uncertainty is likely to take place um, regardless of what the outcome is. Um, you know, we always tend to see a bit of a slowdown in the market um, just whilst people kind of wait and see if any new policies that are likely to come in. Um, but also it tends to affect kind of the top. Discretionary. So across the wider housing markets where we see more needs based buyers, um, you know, people do tend to just continue as they would have done normally, um, particularly those who, um, you know, more needs based, they need to upsize, they're moving for a particular um, reason, they're moving for jobs and so on, relocating. So um, it does tend to affect the top end of the market more, um, but we do sometimes see a general level um, of uncertainty. And then just thinking about other political uh, implications we've seen recently. So last week's budget, um, firstly, looking at the, the two hexagons on the left hand side, these were the two um, kind of policies that we were expecting to see up until kind of a week before the budget itself. So there was a lot of talk. Oh, apologies, my lights have just gone out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we there was a lot of talk around um, a 99% loan to value government backed mortgage, um, which obviously would have provided support, um, particularly for first time buyers. Um, and that was talked a lot about um, and then kind of leaked in the in the run up to the budget. But we never saw that um, come to fruition in the budget itself. Um, and then the second thing that was talked about was um, kind of stamp duty help for those who were looking to downsize. Um, and again, that never came um, to fruition. Um, unsure as to why probably they can make the sums add up in terms of where um, you know the additional money was going to come from but what we did see um, was um, that the tightening of um, the tax net for those who have holiday lets we saw the abolishment of multiple dwellings stamp duty relief um, a reduction in capital gains tax for both buy to let investors 
um, and second homeowners. Um, and we also saw some changes to um, non-DOM status. So focusing on those first three to start with, I think what impact this is likely to have is that it could temper kind of future investor activity and it might tip the balance for any investors who perhaps are already on the fence around whether they want to stick with their current investments or not so particularly that capital gains tax change that might just make um some uh some landlords change their mind in terms of um whether they're going to sell or not but actually they are unlikely to be huge kind of game changers um so the key risks um around all of these issues is that we might see limited future rental supply um kind of in the longer term um, and then finally, just on the changes to non-DOM status. So this has kind of been hanging over the market for a while. We know that um, Labour had talked about introducing um, changes already. They were going to scrap um, non-DOM status themselves if they came into power. Um, so in, in a sense, it's kind of been priced into the markets uh, to some extent already. Um, and we also think that the impact is likely to be offset slightly by the um, four year transitionary period. So still remains to be seen what impact um, this will definitely have perhaps on future demand um, for particularly central London property. Um, but at the moment, um, it, it remains to be seen. So just thinking about the top end of the market for a moment, um, we focus on um, or this chart in particular focuses on what we refer to as the prime market, which is roughly the top five to 10 percent of a given market by value. Um, and what sets them apart most significantly from um, the wider mainstream markets is that they're much less reliant on mortgage debt. So far fewer buyers um, use a mortgage. And so they've remained more resilient compared to um, the wider markets throughout the last um, 18 months or so. But having said that, debt dependence has still driven these markets. So in the areas closest to London, for example, where we see a lot of people upsizing um, and they're more likely to be taking on more mortgage debt, they've been affected more than, for example, the central London markets where we see the vast majority of buyers buying um, with cash. And on the flip side to that, though, they are more likely to be impacted by the uncertainty surrounding the general election, as I touched on, not only because of the more discretionary nature, um, but also because um, any kind of change in government that we may see is likely to impact um, wealthier buyers um, more significantly than others. And then finally, Prime Central London in particular is driven much more by cash, but also very affected by sentiment. So this chart here is just showing um, annual growth levels across the different prime markets um, since the beginning of 2019. You can see that we saw very strong levels of growth um, throughout the pandemic period, particularly in the regional markets where we saw kind of that race for space playing out. Um, you can see the red line there for London, which showed much slower levels of growth. Um, over much of 2021. Um, but then actually, since the um, mini budget that we saw in September of 2022, actually those markets that performed the best are the ones that have also fallen most significantly. So you can see there falls um, of around 5% um, across the regional markets, whereas those London markets holding up more strongly, falling by between um, by more like 1% over the last year. So just thinking about what we're expecting to happen to pricing over the next five years. So this is going back to the overall mainstream markets. Um, so firstly, the top line looking at um, the mainstream UK markets. When we forecast in November, the outlook for both inflation and uh, mortgage rates was much uh, more severe than it is now. So we were expecting that mortgage rates would stay much higher for longer. Um, and so at that time, we were forecasting that we would see price falls of around 3% um, throughout 2024. But you can see there that using our weather symbols, I've added um, a, a little bit of sun um, onto that icon just because we are expecting that it will perform slightly more strongly than we were originally expecting back in November. So we haven't reforecast just yet, but we're expecting that the markets will hold up um, more strongly than a fall of 3% throughout 2024. Um, and at the same time, we are forecasting um, UK transactions of 1.04 million. Um, so to put that into context, before the pandemic, we saw an average um, of around 1.2 million throughout um, each year. 
Um, during the pandemic, obviously, we saw more significant levels um, and they were skewed slightly by um, obviously the stamp duty holiday deadlines and so on. Um, last year, we saw just above a million, so 1.02 million. Um, so this year, originally, we were expecting 1.04. Actually, it's likely to be um, more um, positive than that. Then just thinking about the next five years overall, you can see that we're expecting the strongest levels of growth will happen um, within 2027. So growth of 6.5%. And that's just because that's when we're likely to see kind of the sweet spot between um, much lower levels of interest rates, but also a much more significant uptick in the economy. People will be feeling more confident about their finances and they'll also be, be able to access mortgage debt more easily um, and at much cheaper prices. So that's when the strongest levels of growth are likely to take place, although you can see relatively strong levels um, from 2025 onwards as well, leaving us with a total um, five-year figure of just under 18%. Um, and at the same time, you can see our transaction numbers there. So I touched on already, our average before the pandemic was 1.2 million. So we're expecting that by 2026, we'll have just about recovered to that number, although we'll remain slightly below. And that's largely down to um, the buy-to-let sector, holding it back um, ever so slightly, um, just because of um, a lot of the regulation and changes to taxes that we've seen um, across that sector, meaning that we think numbers will still remain relatively super subdued over that period. And of course, we are expecting that there will be some variation both by um, different regions and by buyer types in terms of transactions. So if we look at the chart on the left hand side to start with, this is our five year forecast across um, the different regions of the UK. You can see that we're expecting the strongest performing regions to be um, those markets in the north. So the northeast, northwest, Scotland um, and also Wales. And this is a result of um, affordability pressures being much less acute within the these markets. Um, so loan to values are much easier to access for buyers within these markets. They haven't seen um, the same levels of long term house price growth that we've seen um, in London and the southeast and the east of England, as you can see on the far right hand side of the chart there. We're expecting that they will be the weakest performing regions um, over that five year period and um, for the opposite regions. So London in particular, we see very um, acute uh, kind of affordability pressures across the capital. It's much harder for buyers to access home ownership, um, particularly given deposit requirements. And so we're expecting there to be much more of a limit in terms of the capacity for house price growth over that five year period in total. And then finally, on the right hand side, if we look at what we're expecting to happen to um, different uh, buyer types in terms of transactions, uh, the bit in that's shaded in yellow is what we're expecting to be forecast. You can see there the top line is um, the proportion of cash buyers across the market. As I touched on, um, we saw more than 40 percent of cash buyers throughout last year. You can see we are expecting that to normalize um, slightly. So we're expecting that those mortgage buyers once interest rates come down a bit, we're expecting that they will take a larger share um, of the market again. So both those home movers um, and those first time buyer numbers, those that are buying with a mortgage back up to where they were kind of before the pandemic at around 30 percent. Then it's really only those mortgage buy to let investors at the bottom there. You can see we're not expecting them to recover quite um, to the same extent that they were um, before the pandemic. So remaining slightly below that level. Um, so that was everything from me. I realised just now that I forgot to say at the beginning that I'm very happy to answer any questions um, that anyone has. So I will just hang on for a couple of minutes um, if anyone wants to type um, any questions into the chat. Um, and if not, I'm very happy for you to contact me um, by email. Um, I can drop my email address um, into the chat as well if anyone would like to contact me in that way. Thank you. So I've had one question. Do you have any statistics on Northern Ireland? Thank you very much. Um, we do actually, we actually don't monitor Northern Ireland. We have a separate um, Irish um, research team who are based there themselves. Um, I can find a contact for you if you would like me to put you in touch. Uh, another question, any trends for new build properties? So 
Um, yes, very similar to what we've seen across the secondhand market, to be honest. Um, and I'd say the key feature for what's driven the new build markets over the last 18 months or so has actually been um, the energy efficiency of them. So obviously where we've seen cost of living pressures um, have an impact on what buyers um, are able to afford, not only on their um, mortgages, but also in terms of what they're spending on their energy bills. New build often looks like a good option um, because we know that they can save a lot more money in the long term when it comes to energy bills. So some people are considering that as an option. I'd say in terms of accessing the market, we also saw really strong um, demand and support coming from um, uh, the help to buy scheme. Sorry, couldn't think of the word then, um, the help to buy scheme. And obviously since that's ended, we have seen kind of a tapering off of um, some first time buyers entering the market through through that scheme. Um, we're not expecting anything new to be introduced in that sense. Um, but overall, we're seeing similar trends um, across the new build market um, as we see in second hand. Um, what is the average percentage of asking price achieved for London? I actually don't have that information, I'm afraid. I do have it just for Savile sales, um, but it's not something that we would share um, publicly. So I don't have it for the whole market, I'm afraid. Great. Well, thank you very much. I've posted my email address in the chat if anyone does have any further questions. Um, and if not, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for joining National Conveyancing Week. Thank you. Thank you.